So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome from Bits Embryo Hyderabad. Uh, I am Sanjay Tiwari. And um, it, a month ago, we had a dream. Uh, we had a dream to host uh, the most eminent people uh, the, who have served the country. And today, uh, when we start off this conclave and we kick off with uh, the one and only Mr. Menon, it is a privilege uh, to be here. Uh, I welcome the audience. Uh, I welcome the students from Bits Pilani, the faculties, and the students from other institutions. Um, without further ado, I'll ask Dia to uh, introduce the conclave a bit, uh, the upcoming lineup, and then without wasting a second, we'll uh, go into the, into the first session. So good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Dia Thomas, and I'm a humble representative of Bits Embryo along with Sanchit. So the Bharat Dialogue, uh, the conclave which we know about, aims to celebrate the accolades of our country, which has been achieved in a multitude of fields. So Bits Empty brings to you a series of talks to commemorate and honor the same. So the lineup of our conclave goes as follows. So today we have a very esteemed personality, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon with us. Tomorrow we will have Mr. Kapil Kumar. He's a senior fellow at uh, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library and provides authoritative insight on many topics like history and education. We also have a surprise speaker tomorrow, and we will be releasing the same after today's session. On 13th, we have uh, Chef Manjunath Mural, who is the first Indian executive chef that scored a Michelin star for an Indian restaurant in Southeast Asia and has retained it for four consecutive years, followed by Nilotpal Mrinal, a very celebrated Indian author, poet, and activist. On 14th August, we bring to you Ms. Anima Patil Stabale and the very honorable Sri Javed Akhtar. And on the last day, that is our Independence Day on 15th August, Bits Embryo will be hosting Mr. R. Madhavan, a household name in the acting industry. So this will conclude our conclave. And I hope that through these exhilarating five days, all of you enjoy and take home a very positive learning experience. Thank you all. Uh, me and Dia will be taking the leave and over to Madhavan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sanjay and Dia for this lovely introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. And today, joining us for the very first session of this conclave is one of the most intellectual minds of Indian diplomacy. The former National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister, serving from 2010 to 14, former Foreign Secretary of India from 2006 to 2009, also served as the Indian Ambassador to China, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Israel, an author, and currently a professor, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon. Welcome, sir, to this conclave. It is an honor for us to have you here today with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good of you to have me here. Uh, so, sir, now, without wasting any further second, I request you to please address and enlighten us on this very vital topic. What is a foreign policy and why does India need it? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mother, and thank you, everyone, for asking me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to you. It was suggested that I speak on why India needs a foreign policy. So what I thought I'd do in about 30 minutes is to say why we bother with a foreign policy, then what kind of foreign policy we really need. And lastly, a little bit about today's situation and, and the kind of adjustments that that requires from us in our foreign policy. Uh, so why do we have a foreign policy? Because quite frankly, we cannot achieve our national goals without a foreign policy. And let me try and clarify. When, when we became independent in 1947, we were in truly abject condition. Life expectancy was 31 years. Literacy was 18.32%. Women were around 8%. Uh, over 80% of the population was below the poverty line. Uh, GDP had grown at less than 0.05% between 1900 and 1947. And there was starvation, disease, hunger. I mean, you name it, we couldn't feed ourselves, famine. It, uh, we were really one of the world's most advanced and prosperous societies had been reduced by 200 years of colonialism to this condition. So the goal, therefore, and this was agreed across the board, was to transform India into a prosperous, secure, modern country where every Indian has the opportunity to achieve their potential. And that was a clear, simple, overriding goal. And it obviously took priority 
over everything else, over status, over recognition, over revenge for whatever wrongs history other people had done to us, over expansion, or any such goals. No, we were not, we're not here to seek a ranking in the world, or, but we are here to improve the welfare of our own people. And frankly, that is something that is still a function of, is, should be our national goal. Uh, being a great power, superpower, all that, frankly, follows success in transforming India. So transforming India has been really the national goal. And foreign policy is necessary to enable that transformation, both by making it possible, using everything that can help us to transform India, uh, but also by creating, as our power grows, to the extent we can, by shaping the environment around us so that it enables us to transform India. Uh, but why is foreign policy then necessary? Surely we can do this at home. We can't do it alone because the task of transformation demands the active engagement with the world. Uh, look at India's resource endowment. Today, over 80% of what we import from the world is maintenance imports, is essential for just the basic running of our economy. We import energy, we import fertilizer, we import non-ferrous metals, we import technology, we import capital. And to say nothing of defense equipment, 70% of which we import. So it's not that we can just transform India on our own. Oh, we're a big country, we have big, big market, young population, etc. We need to be able to pay for the things that we need from the rest of the world. And for this, we need to export, we need to be engaged with the world, we need to be active in the world, not just in the markets, but in every sense. Secondly, the external situation can stop us, can stop the transformation of India. And it makes a big difference. When we became independent in 47, there were three big changes in our geopolitical situation, which is why we can't be just successors of, of the Raj. We can't behave like Curzon and so on. One is partition created an inveterately hostile Pakistan on our Western flank, which cut us off from Central and West Asia, at least physically. Uh, secondly, China entered Tibet in 1950. And for the first time in history, we had a boundary with China. We had Chinese soldiers on our border. Thirdly, the Royal Navy withdrew from the Indian Ocean and we had to begin worrying about our maritime security, something that the Raj at least and the government in Delhi had, Calcutta first and then Delhi had never, never done. So we were in a difficult neighborhood with new states around us, with Pakistan inveterately hostile, suspicious China, whose grip on Tibet at that stage was weak. And, and the third reason why we needed to engage with the world was really because of our geography, our history. If you look at our history, India has done best when, when most connected and engaged with the world. Which are the periods when India was at her height? Uh, and globally in relative terms doing the best. You look at the Mauryas, they were connected through, you look at the Indus Valley civilization, you find Indus Valley seals and so on all the way through Mesopotamia and all the other centers of civilization at that time. You think of, uh, and which parts of India were actually the most advanced were on a par with the other advanced regions of the world and were undergoing industrial revolutions of their own in the 17th, 18th century, before the Great Divergence, before the West actually took off. Uh, it was the maritime parts of India, whether it's Gujarat, whether it's the Malabar coast, whether the Coromandel coast, or Vanga, the whole, from Orissa onwards. These are the parts that were connected with, and it's those parts of India, it's those periods of India when it's most connected, Ashoka, Kanishka, Harsha, the Vijayanagar Empire, you look at the walls of Hampi or Kanjipuram of the temples, they have foreign Central Asians bringing horses to be sold in Hampi in the heart of Karnataka. They, they were all, the Cholas who ruled for 13 centuries, by the way, as an example, 
of longevity. They imported a king from Southeast Asia when the original line ran out in India. Uh, so frankly, the lesson of our geography as a peninsula at the heart of the Indian Ocean region, connected by sea, uh, of when we did best, of our resource endowment, and of the threats that come to us from this difficult neighborhood, all of them point to the need for India to have a foreign policy to manage the situation around us, the environment in which we operate, and to use every possible positive resource externally for the transformation of India. So in a sense, the question, once you have a clear goal, the transformation of India for the foreign policy, that also tells you what kind of foreign policy you have to have. It enables you to prioritize things. If they are things that help or can derail the transformation of India, a very high priority. If they frankly don't matter very much, for me at least, they're not very high priority. They might be emotionally exciting, but not very high priority. Uh, but whether that foreign policy is successful or not depends on more than just clarity of goal. I mean, having a clear goal is all very well, but uh, it's not enough. It's essential, but it's not enough. Two other things matter, the means available to you. And as I said, we started with very little by way of the means. We were partitioned, we were in abject condition, uh, but we have slowly accumulated the means. Uh, so the goal doesn't change still. And frankly, in the foreseeable future, it's not going to change as long as we have poor, hungry, uneducated, and people who cannot live, cannot achieve their full potential, we still need to work on the transformation of India. But the means we have accumulated slowly over time. But the third thing which really matters most is the situation in which you operate, the international situation. And that changes fastest. That has changed three times since we became independent. We have steadily gathered the means, but we've had to adjust to the situation. As our means grow, our agency in the system, in the international system also increased. Uh, the best example is the nuclear field. In 1974, we could carry out a test and we were the only developing country, only in fact, one of the few countries who could do that because we had mastered the technology, but we had to call it a peaceful nuclear explosion. And we then faced 24 years of international sanctions, et cetera, on our nuclear program and on other programs as well, on high-tech transfers, et cetera. By 1998, we were strong enough to declare ourselves a nuclear weapon state and to call the tests what they were, tests of a thermonuclear and a straightforward fission device. By 2008, we managed through the nuclear deal with the US and then what we did with the NSG and the IEA, we managed to get the international community to rewrite their rules, which had actually been written as a counter to our 1974 tests. Uh, and we got them to rewrite those rules in our favor. So we managed to change the international system. That is because our means kept going. And because we showed the capacity to do it ourselves, we were then able to do that. But the situation itself is not something that we can either control or manage yet. Uh, and we've gone through three big phases in the situation in which we operate. The first, of course, was the Cold War. When we became independent, the world was being divided into two blocks between the Soviet Union and the US. And these were, two blocks which actually did, had nothing to do with each other, completely different economic systems. They barely, they didn't even trade with each other. And we creatively chose non-alignment. And this was actually an act of courage, but also very creative to think of non-alignment, which was basically balancing between both blocks and getting both blocks to give us what we needed in order to transform India. You look at the IITs, for instance. You look at where we got our food supplies, for instance. Uh, 
when the West wouldn't give us food in 1953, we went to the Russians, the Russians supplied some wheat. And after that, the West started supplying. We look at industrialization as well. The same with the IITs. We went to the Russians, the Germans, the British, the US, each one set up separate IITs. So basically we were balancing between the parts. And when the balance in the Cold War shifted, when China, for instance, after Nixon's visit in 71, joined the US in an anti-Soviet alliance, virtual alliance, uh, we then balanced the other way, signed the Indo-Soviet Treaty, and that made 1971 was one of the contributing factors to the world, actually China and the US not being able to stop us in 1971 from helping in the birth of Bangladesh. Uh, but after the 1990 collapse of the Soviet Union, the world then entered from that Cold War bipolar situation into a unipolar world, into a world where the US was the sole superpower, the only country on earth who could project military power anywhere on earth. Uh, and we then had to adjust to that. And we did immediately, we chose a multi-directional foreign policy. In fact, we did it even before the Soviets collapsed. Rajiv Gandhi visited China in 1988, two years before the Soviet Union wound up. Uh, we started improving relations with the US. We established an embassy in Israel. We actually started contacts with Taiwan, set up an office there and so on. Uh, but most important, we opened up our economy and started integrating our economy with the world economy. And this actually paid great dividends. This big shift that Marcin Rao and Manmohan Singh between them actually inaugurated after the 91 reforms. Uh, and those actually led to India's highest growth years, the years when we did the most we did the best in, in economic terms. Since 2008, the global financial crisis, however, we have been in a much more difficult world. I mean, some people say that, oh, the rise of China has made it bipolar again. I don't think so. China is still a regional power. She's a global economic superpower, but in military, political terms, in terms of influence, soft power, she's still a local power a local Asian power, which is a problem for us because we are in the same locality, but she's not a global superpower to match the US or anything. So today the world is between orders. The US is no longer doing what it used to do before 2008. It's internally preoccupied, divided, no longer willing to provide global public goods and so on, especially under Trump. Uh, and China's rise has actually, and challenge to the US, and therefore the US pushback against this emerging threat to their hegemony, uh, this, this rivalry, this strategic competition between the two of them, and their contention is actually now next to us. In Cold War, we were a sideshow. We could go on with our life while they did their problems in Europe and elsewhere in Korea, at the other end of Asia but no longer. Now they are, the US and China are both wooing Nepal. China for the Belt and Road, uh, US for their uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, we see the same thing in Sri Lanka, in India itself. And strategic contention, our relationship with China has got much more difficult as China feels that she is powerful and that India is not giving her the respect that she thinks she deserves. Uh, so today, really, we are in a very confused world. I mean, the world, if you look at it today, it's uh, multipolar economically, because there's no question. China is a global economic power. So is the US. Uh, we are much more involved in the world than we ever were before. Uh, if you look at it, uh, we, the balance of power globally has actually shifted. If you look at global GDP, for instance, in 1980, the advanced countries, meaning the OECD countries, accounted for something like 64% of global GDP. By 2016, they were down to 42%. Europe which used to be 30% of global GDP in 1980, 
by 2016 is down to 16 percent. China went from 2.3% in 1980 all the way up to 17.8% of global GDP. Uh, and India went from 3% to 7.24% by 2016. So if you look at it, the US share stayed roughly the same between 25-27% is where it's been since 1980. But the European share declined considerably, in fact, hard. And most of that is now China and a very large proportion India. Actually, if you look at it, uh, India and China together account for well more than half of Asian GDP. Uh, and uh, uh, of Asia's total GDP in PPP terms. And they are in PPP terms, world's largest and third largest economies. Uh, and the result was clear. I mean, between 2001 and 2011, India and China pulled 232 million people out of poverty, out of which 140 million were actually Indians pulled out of poverty. So we, we have done very, very well out of being connected to the world. But it has another consequence, this integration into the world economy. You know, in 1960, merchandise trade was only about 9.8% 9, 9 of, of India's GDP. But uh, by uh, 2012, trade in goods and services, just merchandise trade, was about 43% of India's GDP. I mean, that was a high point. Since then, actually, goods, exports, and imports have actually become a smaller and smaller share of India's GDP. I and mean, they're now around 25% of our GDP. That's still a quarter of our GDP is just goods and services. If you add service, just goods, merchandise trade, if you add services, by 2018, 43% of GDP is uh, trade. That's total trade in goods and merchandise and services. Trade is 43.13% by 2018. These are World Bank figures. Uh, you add to that remittances, you add to that capital inflows, foreign investment and so on. We are talking now of about half our GDP is the external sector. This is a big change from 1960 when frankly, when, as I said, less than 10% of our GDP was, was merchandise trade. Uh, so we've done well out of this integration. I mean, there's no question. Poverty in India has declined. I mean, India, our figures show between 2005, 2012, uh, sorry, 2005 to 2016, something like 270 million Indians were pulled out of poverty, the largest such reduction anywhere in the world in one go. So India didn't do badly out of the integration, but it does create dependencies. It means you must have a foreign policy. You can't just turn your back on the world. We've tried so-called autarky in the late 60s, 70s, early 70s, and those were the years, frankly, when we did worst in terms of transforming India, in terms of improving the lives of our own people. Uh, in, so what do we do in today's situation? Unfortunately, in the last few years, things have actually slowed down. We've raised our levels of integration into the world economy have actually slowed down. We've raised tariffs and customs duties for four years running, five years now actually, uh, walked out of the RCP the Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, which is a free trade agreement between all the ASEAN countries, 10 plus Japan, Korea, China, Australia, New Zealand, and we were part of that. We are the only major economy which is not part of a large regional trading arrangement because the world is being fragmented. Uh, China and the US are decoupling and are obviously trying to create their own areas the NAFTA or the USMCA in North America includes Canada, the US and Mexico, uh, the EU in Europe, and now the RCEP in the Asia Pacific to the east of us. Each of them roughly, well, the EU is the smallest, 
uh, but ASET, NAFTA, USNC are roughly the same size because there's also a TPP in Asia Pacific, which includes Japan and some of the most dynamic agencies. But we are the only major economy which is not part of any of these arrangements. And we are turning inward in every sense, in our politics, in our economy, also in our minds, I think. So what should we do in today's situation? Today, as I said, the world is between orders. We are in a post-pandemic world, which is poorer, where protectionism is rampant, where most countries are turning inwards. We ourselves speak of Atmanirbharta, self-reliance. But the question is, how far do you take it? Of course, self-reliance is a good thing. We need to build our own capabilities. And to be dependent on the rest of the world for defense equipment is shameful. But uh, you can't do everything yourself. And given our resource endowment, we will be dependent on the world for energy unless we can do nuclear, renewables, other forms of energy, and bring them up to speed. Uh, second problem, rise of China, our biggest strategic problem. And China-US friction, which doesn't make our life easier because we have to end up being forced by both sides to choose sides. Uh, you see hotspots and trouble around us. You've seen it in our relationship with China, what happened last year. Maybe we can talk about that. You see it in our relationship with Pakistan, which has really been in the deep freeze. You see regional cooperation in South Asia is very slow. Uh, in fact, not much has happened in the last few years. And yet we have a whole new security agenda today which threatens us with climate change, with maritime security, with cyber security, with international terrorism. And these are things that require international cooperation, but they require international cooperation in a world which is much less capable of cooperating than it's ever been before. Why do I say that? Look at the reaction to COVID. What did the UN, WHO, G20, G7, all these wonderful multilateral things, what did they do? Not much. In fact, each one of us has been left to our own devices ultimately. Uh, so, so we are in a new situation, in a much more difficult situation where it is becoming much more difficult to use external elements to transform India. And so what do we do? For me, the answer is really uh, self-strengthening is a key. There's no question. Uh, we need to reset our relations, whether with China or work out a new, new equilibrium in that relationship. We're still in the middle of a crisis with China. So it's difficult to see where it goes. But also we need to balance China externally. And we are doing that by building up our relationship, not just with the US, but with others on China's periphery who are equally concerned, Japan, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, uh, Australia, and so on. We also need to concentrate at home, integrate the subcontinent, consolidate our own backyard. We need a peaceful periphery if we are to transform India in difficult circumstances. We should be the economic hub, the net provider of security, and be seen as a source of stability by our smaller neighbors in the subcontinent and the Indian Ocean region. The US is an essential partner in this transformation. Not, and everyone says, oh, to balance China. US is not going to fight your wars with China. That you have to show the ability to do. US is an essential partner in transforming India, a source of capital, markets, technology, and she has the means to help you to rise, to change. And she's a power who sees the rise of India since 2000 since George W. Bush, they've seen the rise of India as being in the US strategic interest. China is actually the only great power who doesn't see India's rise as being in her interest. In fact, she sees it and has done a whole set of measures to try and prevent that rise. We also need to get an economic policy which actually works and recognizes India's dependence on the world, but also finds a way of building our own capabilities. I started by saying self-strengthening, that includes military, that includes economic, some self-reliance, but also engaging. You can't just walk away because if you walk, by walking out of RCP, what have we signaled? 
we have signaled not only that we don't think we are competitive today, but that we don't think we will be competitive in 20 years because the RCP provides a 20 year adjustment period before you lower tariffs and actually are open to each other. And credibility is important. And we need to get a new multilateralism going, uh, different from the past, as I said, I think we should forget WTO, UN, et cetera. We've seen how ineffective they are in dealing with the real crises that face the world, whether it was COVID, this pandemic, or whether it's uh, climate change, or whether it is maritime security. I think it's time that my answer is that we do issue-based alliances of the willing. Depending on the issue, you find those partners who share your interests, and who are capable, who have the, if it's maritime security, you have one group of countries who have the capability and the interest. If it's cyber, you have another set of countries and we should work with them. So my own feeling is that frankly, hard times can be followed by good times. Uh, but in order to do that, as I said, we need to build our own strengths and, and we have to recognize that others too share many of our issues. And therefore, we can still work with many others. We, we will end up as a great power at the end of this process if we are successful in transforming India. I've seen in my own lifetime how India's influence and ability to change the system has improved as we have succeeded in changing India. And overall, we haven't done badly. Uh, if you look at it, uh, we in terms of every metric of power today, uh, India has done better than every other country in the world in the last 70 years, has improved her relative position vis-a-vis -vis every country in the world in the last 70 years, most of all in the last 40 years, mm -hmm. except China, who has done even better than India. Uh, but that should only make us want to do more to transform India. Thank you. I'll stop there and I'd be very happy to hear what you think or to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. That was indeed very impressive and important piece of information that you shared with us. And your viewpoint was absolutely magnificent and eye opening for all the listeners uh, and all the audience. Uh, so uh, now let's move on to the Q&A session, sir, uh, where we have got some very good questions uh, regarding this topic uh, from our curation team and some very enthusiastic students. Uh, so starting with the first question, uh, we have had a rather insightful discourse on the concept of foreign policy, and you just now explained it so well to us. Uh, as an extension to that, uh, the Indian diplomats play a vital role for the execution and implementation of the same. Uh, having established this, how will the roles and relevance of IFS officers change in the coming decades, considering that they are understaffed in the present scenario. And also your thoughts on the discussion for conducting a separate examination for the IFS as opposed to UPSC. Uh, you know, for Indian diplomats, frankly, our strength comes from what? From India. Yes. If India is regarded as strong, as growing, as the future, then we have strength. I, I've seen it myself. I know when I joined the service in 1972, I know very long time ago, right? Uh, it was very different. I mean, your, your voice really barely counted, but today your voice counts to a much greater extent. As I said, that's why I gave that nuclear example. If you can change the rules of the game internationally, that shows that you have a certain power, certain amount of power. You did it together with the US. You, it was in the US interest to do it. It wasn't that you could do this alone, but it took diplomacy. Now, what we do changes depending on the circumstance and as I said, India's means, India's power. When I first went to Peking on my first posting in 1974, 80% uh, of our time, my time at least was as the youngest in the embassy, was arguing with the Chinese foreign office about the border, about the boundary, being called in at 10 o'clock at night to be blown up. Then I would have to go back and blow them up. 
etc. Uh, frankly, in between, you had got to the stage where the border barely figured in your conversation, but you were doing a lot of economic work. China's, even now, I mean, 2000, despite what happened on the boundary, she became our biggest trading partner again. She took position number one again as our trading, among our trading partners. So you, and this is generally true. It's ever since 91, Indian diplomats have had to do much more economic diplomacy. They've had to look at, we in the beginning, because we didn't have people, power, ability, the means, we relied on the multilateral system. When we had in 48, when the army told Nehru that they weren't sure they could hold in Kashmir, please go to the UN. He went to the UN looking for a solution. We've never been to the UN again. In fact, in 71, the UN voted, you know, everybody except two countries <laughs> voted against what we were doing, but we still did what we did in 71. That's the difference. Over time, what you do, how you do it depends, as I said, on your goal stays the same, but on your means mm. and on the situation, on finding allies, others you can work with to achieve it. I think the, the future is really, there's, there's three or four new areas of, of diplomacy like technology. And science diplomacy today really matters. Uh, and I think energy diplomacy is going to get much harder, but it's tied into technology because it's no longer just fossil fuels and how do we access and it's not energy security in the sense in which we used to talk about it after the OPEC, the oil crises of 73, 79 and so on. Today, it's a much more complicated. Third thing I think is there is going to be a lot more negotiation in the new domains to lay down standards, to how do you, and I mean, this is happening already. You can see there's a form of decoupling. Each one is pushing his own you know, standards. We are pushing 5GI, for instance. The, the commercial companies all tell us, oh, you're killing us because you're adding costs to us. They want one global standard, so a level playing field, they think. But who's it going to be? Is it going to be Chinese standards, American standards, European standards? Indian standards, you know, and this is only one small example. Uh, this is true of the whole cyber domain. It's true even in, in other domains. So I'm not sure whether you, we will not have to learn a whole new way of dealing with these issues internally to organize ourselves, to be able to influence the world and make sure that the world, this is why I say create an enabling environment. And that environment today includes much more than just, you know, politics and military. Are there enough IFS people? Never. There will never be enough. Uh, does it need a separate exam? I don't think so. Because frankly, IFS Indian diplomats are made after they're in the service. What the exam does, quite frankly, is... Uh, it, uh, I know I'm a bit cynical here, but, and it's easy for me to say, there is no exam which is so fine that there is a big difference between number one and number 5,000 when 13 lakh people are doing the exam. I mean, there is no system which is a sieve, which is so fine to actually distinguish. So what does it give you? It gives you somebody who is good at whatever he has studied, B, somebody who's lucky. And when Napoleon was asked, what quality do you look for in your generals? His simple answer was, I want lucky generals. Because it's a fact. You want people, but you want people who are good at what they chose to do. Exactly. It doesn't matter whether he did history or physics or maths or what. As long as he's good at what he does, the rest, the diplomacy part of it, the working, the world, all that we will teach. Frankly, and now that I teach, you, I might teach you all kinds of skills today. 10 years from now, they'll be out of date. And, and I have, you know, I have fellow teachers who teach at the IIT and so on. And they are increasingly coming to the point of view where we can teach you how to think, how to learn skills, make you a perpetual learner, but we 
but the skills we give you, frankly, will be outdated. I don't remember anything I was taught in school. I mean, yes, I can add two plus two, but that I didn't need to go to school for. In fact, I didn't go to school till I was 10. My mother taught me at home because we were in places like Lhasa and so on. So what we need to do in an education, and this is especially true of the IFS, I don't think we should worry about the numbers so much as how good are they at their jobs. And ultimately, less and less of the IFS's work, you see, originally the IFS had to do everything because India was not organized. But today, India is organized. Today, when you negotiate standards, this is, yes, you need an IFS person there in the room, but you also need somebody who knows the subject. You need somebody who has a technical competence and it's a question of working them together, working the Indian system to engage with the world. It's not enough just to have a brilliant diplomat there. You will need more than that in today's world. When it comes to economics as well, to economic diplomacy as well, science diplomacy in each of these. So for me, I see the IFS's role changing over time. As India develops, India grows. And so I'm again nervous of saying, look, this is an absolute number. We must have the same number as we're organized differently from other countries. We're not trying to do exactly what other countries do. People compare us with Australia. Australia does their whole foreign trade, commerce, everything under the foreign ministry. So they will have more people. We do that separately. Commerce ministry does it. We lend them some people and we try and integrate them, but we do it differently. So a uh, short answer to you is I, the role will keep changing and it's it will develop as india develops okay that was quite a good explanation sir uh, thank you so the next question we got is uh, in one of your ndtv interviews with shekhar gupta back in 2018 you remarked that we got the 1991 to 2008 world economy right but post the 2008 crash whether we got the world economy right i'm not sure so what do you think now? Has the picture changed uh, or what are your views? You know, I, we, I think we got 2008 right because we actually, we did exactly what everyone else did. Pump priming, put a lot of money into the economy and we did okay until about 2012. But I think three things happened. I don't, what happened to Europe, the Euro crisis and so on. Secondly, the turn inwards to protectionism actually came after 2011, 2012, because immediately after the shock in 2008, 2009, when people came to London at the G20, uh, people were so frightened of what had happened, of repeating what happened after 1930, after the Great Depression, the crash of 1929, that they didn't want, so they actually agreed on expanding quotas in the World Bank, on keeping their markets open, on laying down new standards for banking regulation under internationally and so on. And the world actually managed to get past 2008 reasonably well. But by 2012, 13, it became clear that people were now regressing. They didn't change World Bank quotas. This is one reason why the Chinese started an AIIB, a nation infrastructure and investment bank of their own. Uh, because what was promised in London was not done in 2009. And people started closing there. They started buy American under the top, under their own bills. Same thing with China. People became much more mercantilist and began closing off their economies. Uh, unfortunately, we've gone the same way, I think, in the last five years. I think that walking away from RCP was not a very clever thing to do. Because as I explained to you, we are tied to the world now. Our future prosperity depends on how we deal with the world. We can't just say, okay, we have a very big economy, we'll manage on our own. We don't want to go back to autarky. We saw what it did to us in the 60s and 70s and the kind of shoddy goods that our people had to put up with and how uncompetitive it made us in the world. And we want to be the best in the world and you have to be competitive. You have to get out there and get involved in that. Uh, so I'm, I I'm not sure that we're reading the world economy right now. 
so I wouldn't date it to 2008 so much as to slightly later from 2012 onward. And 2012 I also use because we did some things like retrospective taxation, for instance, which we are now having to unroll. Uh, there are other things we did to make the factors of production very expensive. You know, when you look at the basics, whether it's land, whether it's, I mean, land acquisition is still one of the most complicated things in India. It raises operating costs for everyone. The price of cost of capital also is very high. I mean, how did China boom? She made all the factors cheap, whether it's land, labor, capital. She made them all cheap. Interest rates in China have always been very low. Uh, so I, I'm not so sure that we quite adjusted to the new post global financial crisis world very well. I, I still wonder. It's, it's more nuanced than my, that statement that you quoted than that suggests. But overall, yes, I think that is my general feeling. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so next question is, uh, uh, Bhavesh Mishra asks from the comment uh, in the FB Live, in today's time, how can youngsters avoid polarizing political views? What would be your thoughts on this? Well, my advice is, and this is why I, I frame this, the goal, national goal in this term, transforming India. If you think of yourself as an Indian, my loyalty is to India. And, and even as a civil servant, I always thought, I serve, I don't serve the government of the day. I serve government of India. I serve India. And for a foreign service officer, it's even easier because I, I don't have to deal with the local MLA and the local MP every day. And I'm actually representing India abroad. So my job is to think for India and to act for India where I can, right? And to point out to the government what, what we can do, what we can't do, what I think is useful. And as long as we do that, I think it's possible to avoid polarizing politics. There will always be people who will try and drag you into it. I mean, and they will call you names at both sides. That actually is a badge of honor. If the extremes call you names, then you know you're doing something right. But I think you need at the end of the day to be able to face your own face, your own mirror, right? Ultimately, what is the only judge that you can actually follow? Can you face yourself in the mirror and say, look, I did my best and I did my best by my country. Not one government, not one leader, not one political party, not some organization. That's not what I'm here for. And if you can do that, I know it's not easy. It's not because you, we have all the pressures. We have to make a living. We have to live in the world. We have friends who have opinions. You have all kinds of things. But ultimately, I think that is the only way that you can. So this is why I say old-fashioned patriotism is a good thing. Hypernationalism, not so good. Because that does other people down. But I think as an individual, for me, that's the simplest criteria. I mean, is what I'm saying really good for the country? And, you know, when you, I mean, my own experience, uh, the only prime ministers I've dealt with closely, you know, Narasimha Rao, Vajpayee, and Manmohan Singh, all of them, when you go to them, they're not party political in their mm -hmm. approach to civil servants or to others. Well, I'm sure they think of party politics in its place, they do it. But they're not making party political. They were never making party political demands on you. And, and your respect for them went up as a result. Because they did, if you did say, I think this is good for the country, they did respond to it accordingly. And Vajpayee especially used to always ask, but are you sure it's the right thing for the country? And he used to like testing you. But but, you know, I, I do think that's, that's the standard. You need to set goals which are not partisan, which are, and are not status, personality linked. You know? uh, that was very insightful, sir. Uh, next, uh, with us uh, also, we have an alumni current, uh, now who has been one of the most active speakers on many national forums and also worked with the World Bank on a project. Uh, he brings us some questions from him and the audience, uh, Aditya Mishra. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the kind words, Madhur. And uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Menon, for a wonderful discourse there. I think really insightful there. 
uh, I, I think as an extension of what you just uh, spoke about, we have seen two big events at the international level in an, from an organization perspective. One is, uh, of course, the Brexit, uh, as we call it, the exit of uh, United Kingdom from the European Union. And secondly is uh, the destructuring of Asia, so to speak, which uh, alarmingly also showed us the importance of Asian diplomacy, probably in the same light or perhaps even more than you know the, uh, the diplomacy that goes in to get a permanent seat in the Security Council. Uh, and I also do understand that you have you know quite talked extensively about uh, this in your recent book as well. Uh, you know, we would like to hear some uh, you know interesting insights from you in terms of uh, how much of a factor uh, Asian diplomacy has been, or perhaps could have been, had it not been as underplayed as it was in historically speaking. Thank you. Well, I you know. I think Asia has always been a complicated area, but for us, it's home, right? For an Indian. And I think we underestimate how significant Asian diplomacy was for previous. That's why I wrote this book, India and, and Asian Geopolitics. <coughs> uh, but because certainly at the beginning, a lot of our diplomacy, you know, whether it was Bandung, whether it was non alignment, whether it was our active role in the Korean War in Indochina, where we headed the International Control Commission, all that was concentrated on building what Nehru used to call an area of peace in Asia, because he thought that's essential if we are to develop India. But you cannot develop India if you're stuck in the middle of wars, fighting. And we did fight four wars in the first 24 years of, of independence. So, but since then, as our means grew, our deterrence grew, and our ability to manage the situation grew, I think we have avoided that kind of large scale conventional war, which would be the biggest distraction. And as, so as Yusidaidi said, nobody wins from a war. Even the victors are actually defeated. Uh, but uh, so, for me, Asian diplomacy has always been important, but there were there was a period in between where A, we turned inwards just when Japan was trying to integrate Asian economies uh, and started investing in industrialization in Asia, in the Tigers to start with. But you know, whether it's South Korea, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, you know, in ASEAN and started building supply chains, global supply chains uh, to serve primarily Western markets. That was exactly when we turned inwards. We, and we cut ourselves off. Politically also, that was when the world was divided most clearly between the US and China on one side and the Soviet Union on the other. And we had very difficult relations with both the US and China. And so we ended up in the 70s, 80s, when integration was happening, we ended up outside it. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, I think we opened the economy and that's why I quoted those figures. Now we're much more part and we are part of the global economy. Uh, even though I don't think most Indians realize the extent to which, and when I said more than half your GDP is the external sector, I think most Indians would find, find that quite a shock because most of we think everything is our own and it all happens here. Uh, but for me, the future is Asia. And the more uncertain the world, the more uncertainty, the more the risk of conflict, the more there's great power tension or rivalry, the more important it is that we concentrate on keeping our own periphery peaceful, primarily the subcontinent and the Indian Ocean region, but also working with the most dynamic economies. If we want to grow our country, make our people prosperous, we have to work where the growth is. There's no point working with people whose economy is going down the tubes. So we need to work with Southeast Asia, with Northeast Asia. So Asia then becomes critical. West Asia becomes critical for the obvious reason. Without energy, you don't have an economy. And that's our main source. And we will keep importing energy, whether we like it or not. We even import coal now, which we have, but of terrible quality. So 
for me, these are the important issues, managing Asian diplomacy, managing Asian geopolitics so that we can transform India. Permanency, frankly, for me is a distraction. I've said it before, I'll say it again, it's a beauty contest. You get 128 countries in the General Assembly voting for you and the five permanent members, and yes, you'll be a permanent, you'll get a permanent seat. But so what? At a time when the UN means nothing, has done nothing for you in COVID, and is less and less effective. So why? You want the status? You want the recognition? That shows some kind of inferiority complex. Why do you want other people to tell you how good you are? You don't know how good you are? I mean, you should have an honest opinion of your strengths, your weaknesses, of what you have to do. We have a lot to do. We're not perfect, but we also have our strengths and we don't need other people telling us that you are good, you are bad, oh, wonderful, now we put you on the Security Council. I don't understand this, frankly. But anyway, but now obviously I'm not in a majority on this. Uh, Brexit opens some opportunities, but I think it diminishes both Europe and Britain. I mean, it weakens both of them in the long run. Yes, there'll be some opportunities uh, in Britain, especially as Britain seeks a role and tries a comeback. But ultimately, Britain, I think, will, you know, return to a much more isolationist position. Uh, if you look at British industry, it's pretty hollowed out already. She's primarily a financial services center, and that's not something that will survive Brexit untouched. I mean, it will continue, but it won't. Already, she, you know, when I joined the service, all world media information was basically out of London, no longer. That role is gone. Uh, so bit by bit, I think you're seeing Little Britain emerging. Uh, and yes, there'll be opportunities. It's, it's still a major economy. It's a big economy by global standards. But uh, I, I don't see Brexit having helped because it's also kept the Europeans very sort of focused on their own neighbor, on their negotiations, their own internal. And this secular trend from, that's why I quoted the GDP figures from 1980 and Europe's share in global GDP, that and their inability to actually run a common foreign and defense policy so far, that I think will still affect their, their utility to you. There'll be an economic opportunity. They will be friends and helpful when you try and devise international standards and so on, which are not either American or Chinese or Russian, uh, yes, all that, but, but their overall utility and role in the world is shrinking, and I don't see that change. That was quite a succinct answer. Thank you so much uh, for that. And on that yeah. note, I suppose uh, I am in that minority as well with you, sir. Uh, uh, I, I don't really think that the permanent council membership is something that's completely relevant, but I think it's outdated, to so to speak. Uh, it was conceived in a time where Perhaps the relevance in tandem with the UN spoke of a very different narrative. And then, you know, I think we have stuck on to something which is uh, just not in the market right now. You know, um, what worries me is we have moved from a position where we said, why do people have a veto? Why do people have a permanent seat? Democratize the UN. That used to be our initial revolutionary instinct. Right. We move from revolution to reform. Now we want to seat with you. We want to be one of you. Now we are busy inviting the former colonial powers, Britain, et cetera, to send ships into the Indian Ocean, France. I mean, it's a historical irony, right? The perfect narrative indeed, sir. Indeed. And, but we need to think, how does it look to everybody else? Mm -hmm. What do the others think then of you? And what it also means for the other countries, you know, uh, claiming uh, such, uh, uh, you, you know, standing as a permanent member. I mean, it changes the whole narrative as a whole, uh, so to speak. For me, this is an unnecessary complication. <laughs> I mean, there are more important things to do. But anyway, let's see. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, the, the, the aspect of, uh, you know, war being the the worst possible outcome uh, as a failure of diplomatic mechanisms here. I think we have seen that time and again, right? Uh, 
parties, political parties, leaders, regardless of their allegiances. It's perhaps the human cost, especially in a country like us, you know, uh, which is the most expensive cost. It's not a cheap affair by any means. So, so thank you so much uh, for answering that question in great detail, sir. Really. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Aditya Mishra. Uh, so not taking any more of your time, sir, uh, this is the last question for today. Uh, as Bitsians, uh, we have always believed in the spirit of contributing to our society as responsible citizens. Along those lines, and also since the name of our conclave is the Bharat Dialogue, what is, your, what is the idea of Bharat to you and how can we contribute to it as responsible stakeholders? For me, Bharat I mean, is, is actually, uh, it's a remarkable civilization, if you look at it. You know, I mean, I, I used to walk in the Himalayas in the 60s, for instance, and you see this postman in the middle of nowhere, delivering a postcard, walking six, 10 miles to deliver one postcard to a hut in the middle of the Himalayas. Why? He doesn't have to, you could throw it into the river, go back, say I've delivered, finished. No, nothing's gonna happen, but he'll do it. For me, that is India, you know? It is, there's a culture, a civilization of tolerance, of pluralism, but of duty, of karma, of the sense of, of justice, which is very strong. You know, when you, and that sense I think is true of, of, of most Indians, overwhelmingly. What, so for me, the core of Indianness is really that sense of belonging to something much bigger than, than we as individuals are, right? And, and that is primarily cultural and civilizational in our case. It's not political. People have tried to make it political, but it's not political. It's not personal. It's not some leader or, you know, yes, we have Godmen and so on, but ultimately at core, we are cynical about all that. We know what they amount to. Uh, and, and we are basically tolerant people among ourselves. Mm. And it's amazing how, how that spread right through the subcontinent. That for me is the core of India. And that is worth preserving rather than trying to imitate, you know, some 19th century European countries or ideologies or trying to force ourselves into some credo which everybody must believe, everybody must speak the same, must look the same, must think the same, must talk the same. That's never going to happen. That's our uniqueness. You know, we, I mean, this is when we say unity and diversity, it's the exact opposite of what the Americans say, a plur pluribus unum. They say from many to unity. They want union. At the, we are actually celebrating diversity and that's our strength. As long as we do that, we're okay. When we don't do it, we have trouble. We have social trouble. We have all kinds of trouble. And we've, this has been true throughout. And as long as we stress that, the diversity, the pluralism, the tolerance of India, we are also an example to other people. I mean, until the 80s, even in the 90s, in Sri Lanka, I remember, people would want to learn from the Indian constitution and how it worked. That's much less true today. When you start looking less tolerant, less open, then other people's desire to learn from you also and your influence, your soft power starts going down. So purely as a diplomat, I think it's very important that, that we rededicate ourselves to the basics, which, are, which frankly, for me, the best expression is the constitution. Uh, and it's, the preamble is certainly a document well worth reading. But that's my idea of India. Uh, I don't know whether everybody will agree with this anymore. I, there's always been contestation about the idea of India. But you know, the nice thing about being a diplomat, at least an Indian diplomat, nobody ever mistakes you for anything else. When you, wherever you go in the world, people know you're an Indian immediately. Uh, I don't think there are many people who can say that. So Indians are unique. 
and we do have certain characteristics which the world recognizes we don't we are still busy arguing about it among ourselves and having a good time but that's part of being indian that was such a truly such a beautiful description of india by you sir it truly feels like sare jahan se acha hindustan hamara <laughs> and <laughs> beautiful sir so i think sir we are done with the questions and uh, those questions were really wonderful and we thank you so much for your time effort and obviously the knowledge that you shared with us and helping us make this session a great success thank you thank you very much i really enjoyed that and those were really good questions thanks